Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Sweetie hey. Shakespeare podcast. I'm super sorry that we don't have, when we do the little Zoom calls, we don't have the iconic and very cheesy uh, intro song for you guys. But we do have a very special episode talking and on location at 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea <laughs> with our very own <laughs> Jeremy Feebig and Jessica Osno here with us today. First, before we get started, I'm going to tell you a little bit about what we're about in case this is your first episode of watching. This is where we talk about everything Shakespeare, all your favorite teas, and everything sweet in the world. Sweet Tea Shakespeare is a nonprofit theater company and training ground inspired by Shakespeare and the early modern period in its spirit and operations based in Fayetteville and Raleigh, North Carolina. Here on the podcast, we bring in a guest, or in this case, two, and get a closer look on what makes Sweet Tea possible. You can catch this episode as a video podcast on YouTube, or if you just want the audio, say you're driving or you just you got chores to do or something like that, we'll still be there for you on all your favorite podcast services, such as Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and Amazon Music. Today's episode is made possible by a number of delightful people, such as the folks at the Capitol Encore Academy, Napkins, the restaurant, the Arts Council of North Carolina, and Fayetteville and home light. We'll talk more about them later during our ad break. But for now, I'm here. I'm I'm about to drown in just any second. We're here to talk about 20,000 leagues, and I cannot wait to get started. So these two people are very special because Jessica is actually the one who has been writing the show. Uh-oh, tell me a little bit about that. Uh, the I'm My background is in English literature, and so it's I've always loved stories. And where I found sort of a delightful intersection is stories come to life on a stage. And so getting to adapt things for Sweet Teeth through the years um, has really been a joy. And this was an interesting sort of challenge. It was the first novel that I was probably the least familiar with. Um, and so it starts as all good stories do with with the book, or all good adaptations do with the book. Um, just going through figuring out like what, what we needed to sort of distill and what would work, in, especially in this kind of production. Um, so it was an interesting challenge. Nice. So you said this is not your first um, original script from with Sweet Tea. What are, what are some of the other ones you did? Um, it started back, the first thing I ever sort of adapted was like, it was a very small section of Midsummer um, for Bottom's Dream back in 2014. Mm-hmm. Yeah, something like that. I think it was, it was a long time ago, it feels like. Uh, and then we did Paradise Lost in 2017. Um, uh, sort of, <laughs> I found all my notes from my Milton class at Campbell University in the margins. And that was a delight, um, but a really difficult challenge. It was my first time working with any sort of immersive theater. So um, trying to pick up like the loose threads of the story that are maybe lost in narration, or as is the case with Paradise Lost, um, sort of alluded to uh, as happening off stage. But in an immersive production, you sort of have to craft that and figure out a way to show that or stage it. Um, And so we, the lovely folks at Holy Trinity hosted us and we built heaven, earth and hell uh, in their space, uh, which was a really fascinating thing. Like I still love looking at pictures from that show. Mm. Um, And so with 20,000 Leagues, again, we have another interesting space to work with. And I've been out of the production side totally this time. So just sort of like figuring out what details of the story will play and how to structure it. Um, Having a little bit of familiarity with how a production like this can work or should work, um, sort of breaking down the story into like action beats and then creatively filling in um, or taking bits of narration and expanding pieces of the story as needed. Um, so that's, it's sort of been an interesting progression from like a little snippet of bottom stream through Paradise Lost and now this. So, so tell me about like 20,000 Leagues what are some of the, because this is not just, obviously, as, as we try to do with the promotional material and stuff, we, we try to make sure people know that this is not just a traditional, you sit back and you watch a show. Now, what makes 20,000 interactive? What, what happens in it? Without getting too much like spoilers or anything like that, obviously. Yeah, and Jeremy, he talked about the actual staging. In terms of the story, I think one of the, the points of appeal for the story that always has been is the the thrill of like investing or being involved in an adventure, um, going somewhere that is physically impossible or thought to be physically impossible. Um, it's why there's so many other stories that take us places that we can't go. 
Um, and so there's always been this fascination with going beyond with what, what is out there, what's the next thing. And when the novel first came out, that was it. Like nobody had ever, like people dreamed of exploring these depths. Um, and that's sort of the great mystery that starts the story is like, what can possibly be this monster that's, or this thing that's causing all these mysterious like sightings of like a floating island or damage to ships. Uh, and so it begins with mystery, a point of entry to excite our curiosity. Um, and so that's one of the, the great delights is we get to be sort of involved in solving that mystery. Um, and so in the way that good stories invite the reader in and make them care about what's happening, 20,000 Leagues does that. And so audience members will get to own pieces of that to help solve puzzles, um, to look for clues, to uh, help the crew solve problems in a way. Um, so as, as it, hopefully the best stories are inevitable, but not predictable. Like, you know, it can't end any other way in the end when you get there, but you don't know exactly how you're going to work mm -hmm. out. There's always an element of uncertainty. Um, and we sort of anticipate that. It's, why the genres of stories that we like are so popular. We like that sense of involvement, but also the thrill of like not knowing exactly what it's going to be. Um, yeah. And then getting to sort of choose our own involvement in the story. So it's, as you say, it's not a, a thing where you can sort of sit back and be a passive audience member. So if it's something you like, um, that this will sort of challenge your traditional theater going experience. Right. Right. Tonight's so, <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, no, it was perfect. But, I mean, it's weird to talk about you guys. We, you don't want to hear my mouth running the whole time. But um, uh, I so researching for for tackling such a beast as this. Both of you guys uh, went underwater and did some deep sea diving in, in this process, right? You <laughs> just went under. Just <laughs> so, Jeremy, oh, so many metaphors. Yeah. Right. Right. So Jeremy, tell me about uh, directing this kind of beast of immersive theater, which is, uh, it's not exactly Shakespeare, but it does have like that, that classical element about it. Tell me about that. Sure. Well, I'm co-directing with uh, Tracy Kuhn Zapata and mm -hmm. we've, um, we're splitting duties uh, because we've both been engaged in a kind of research. Uh, so I went to the ocean in the Bahamas last, last week, week before last, I should say. And Tracy just got back from a cruise. So we were kind of covering for each other. Um, and maybe we're bringing back some some insight from that. I don't know. Um, I will say, so directing for this kind of approach, which is we call immersive, and it is it is a kind of immersive. Um, immersive, in my mind, covers haunted houses. It covers uh, like escape rooms. It covers like interactive kind of gaming kinds of things. So theater is anywhere where, you know, people are, are watching and being watched. And so this is just kind of a, a, a kind of theater that's just been happening for forever. And immersive is the label that has been thrown on it in the last uh, several years. And so um, we've taken Jessica's script and basically had tons of sort of brainstorming parties about it um, and conversations. Um, and throughout, like probably, I mean, definitely dozens of ideas, maybe into the hundreds of ideas about how this can work. And then the directing process is really about um, editing and scaling back all of those ideas into something that's like both experiential um, and uh, clear. So like we know what's going on and we can invest in the characters and, and all of that. So, um, and we've taken lessons from our, our previous um, immersive endeavors with Bottom Stream and Paradise Lost. And I went to London this summer and was able to see a lot more and different kinds of immersive theater. So I brought some of those lessons back and we're just kind of like working with the cast to see what works and, and kind of how to craft, how to use these tools and techniques to do what all theater ought to do, which is have a an adventuresome story that audience can invest in. Yeah. Um, so I, I'm such a sucker for like learning about the, uh, the roadmap of how creative projects get made. And so I want to know with, with tackling any kind of immersive theater, there's a lot of moving parts at the same time when it comes to that interactivity. 
So where do you start directing? Do you start with the, uh, the scenes that are the traditional scenes or do you start with one piece? Like where, where does, where does that fall in your agenda? Um, for me, all theater is about story. And so we have to start with that. And, and so Jessica wrote us a, a script, um, some of which was scripted and some of which was more like outline form. And we are basically, the process is like, um, what are we, we got tons of ideas in this moment. Um, and we're inviting the cast to pitch in on that and, and the directing team and Jessica and, and other collaborators, crew and others. Um, and just like going moment by moment and making sure the story is connected to itself and that whatever we're doing in terms of an activity or a game or an immersive moment is really in service of the story. Um, that's what I mean by editing is like, we're, we're, we have lots of ideas. We do have tons of like, and, and like Jessica's script is, has captured like almost every idea we've had about a given moment or a given sequence or whatever. And, but, uh, and those are all useful sort of in the ideation phase, um, just in terms of like dreaming big and, and like trying to find something that inspires us so we can inspire others. And then the rehearsal process is really about like uh, trying some of those out, um, uh, sacrificing some to the, uh, the, the clock and the time limit, um, and then like really sculpting and shaping uh, kind of moment by moment to what gets us to the, the sort of clearest story that people can invest in. Gotcha. One thing like as you're, as you're talking, like it's, it seems like this eminently suited to the story. Like a story that's like so much about exploration and experimentation. It's a story of science um, and adventure. Like that, the process very much suits like the nature of what's happening in the tale itself. Now, have you both? You both have read the book, right? The original source material. I, I have read. Go ahead. You, you first. I was going to say I was. I'm as as an English major. I'm almost ashamed to say I had not read the full text before I had to read it for the script. Oh so no! It's not my not my traditional field, but like I'd seen the movie and but I'd never actually read the the novel. Um. So, but I enjoyed it once I got there. So yeah. Well, don't worry. Don't worry. I'll cut out that part. Your reputation is intact. You don't have to. <laughs> Thank you. Um. I read it. I feel like long ago. I can't say that with 100% certainty, but it would have been in junior high or maybe early high school. Um, I feel like I was sort of familiar with the story, much more with like the pop culture versions of that, whether it be like a children's book or a movie. Um, but uh, unlike being the writer, I think the director's job is to be a standing for the audience. And I always talk about the, the hat I have to put on um, to be a kind of audience member who's just every night experiencing whatever this is for the first time and talking through what works and what doesn't. Um, and so it it's to my advantage to not know too much about the material and just to make whatever we have or on the page and sort of in our bodies uh, work on the night and hopefully stitch that together over a process. Yeah, yeah, I've I've heard that a lot from. I mean, because I obviously have not directed anything, but like, um, at least from an actor's perspective, there's there's only so much between that. There's, there's a line of researching, and then if you cross that line, that threshold, then you're going to be adapting too much of what someone else has already done, someone else's performance, someone else's material, and then it, you lose your own identity <laughs> of said performance, or in this case, production with that. Mm -hmm. So I can, I totally understand, you know, having that kind of um, trying to keep that, maintain that, that unique perspective on that. Um, so we talked about, there is a, a movie. When did the movie come out? It was in the fifties. Yeah. And, but there've been two adaptations that I know of since then that were like nineties, early two thousands. Like there was a, a TV series and then, um, I think it was like a made for TV kind of movie situation. Um, I'm not familiar with those at all. I've just, a cast member introduced them to me um, yeah. and I'll watch them after the show is up. Um, but the the one I was familiar with is like the Disney 1950 something. Yeah. Got a way of tale to tell you. <laughs> right, right. And I'm, and I'm asking that because do you think 
these classic novels, like they tend to um, either get lost in the weeds uh, and and, ke- and kept in that traditional sense where it's it stays as that, or someone will come along and modernize it for a, a movie adaptation or a, a played ad- ad- adaptation too. Do you think that Twenty Thousand needs to stay? like within its time period is it locked in that kind of time period of um am i i know it's kind of a weird question yeah. I'm, I'm, and i'm wording it really horribly too no, it, it, it makes sense um because the like my my field is like and i feel very strongly about being at, like true to the, the accuracy of the story sometimes to my detriment um but <sighs> I think one of the one of the things that makes the story itself work is that there are so heavily entrenched in the scientific language. Like there are whole chapters, um, like in terms of adapting the script, I had to skim over because I was like, nobody's going to care about any of this. Um, and then to like, it's it's outdated and it, like terminology is outdated or things are um, have sort of been debunked or disproven. Um, so in terms of the science, like it it would be if you don't, if you don't stay in some respects within parts of the world, it doesn't make sense anymore. Um, but then there's still things like, um, like there is in terms of researching it, there was like, um, there's moments where like they talk about places, uh, in the text and they'll give coordinates or they'll describe some sort of natural phenomenon. Um, and I would have to stop and look it up and be like, okay, does this make, like look at the actual map reference points, um, and say like, is this actual um, in terms of the way the story is describing it, is it really that bad or that stressful um, or that dangerous? And so in, in looking that up, I found out it actually is. Um, and it's still uh, sort of like this great sea mystery. So there's some things that translate really well and other things not so much. Um, so I think it, it really depends on what kind of story you're trying to tell. There's still something out there that we can't, we can't know. Um, and so I think, and you can modernize it to some extent, but some of the wonders of like undersea travel um, out of context are a bit lost in a more modern, modern or modernized telling, I guess, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, what are some, and this kind of, this goes for both of you too. What are some, and they can be classical, they can be contemporary, they can be whatever you want. Uh, some book adaptations that you would want to be adapted, whether it is play or movie. Um, I uh, know it's this tough. I think it's tough. I'll start. I'll start you off. I'll give you a little little moment to think. But I've been reading a lot of. Um, <laughs> this is not. I'm going to call myself out. I've been really reading a lot of self help kind of books or like people mm-hmm. who have similar. Uh, uh, like there's this book called Obsessed that I just read, um, talking about someone discovering they have OCD, and I feel like OCD. There's such a language about it, such a taboo thing about it, where it's only confined to the. Um, keeping things in, in an order. And, um, I'm trying to, I'm, <laughs> I'm, thinking, I'm looking at my background, how we're 20,000 leagues under the sea. I'm in the ocean. I'm talking about OCD, but, um, yeah. So, uh, they, this person is in high school. They're starting, they're, they're finding out about it and it's a story throughout, right. It's just in the, in the form of a, of a memoir of a, um, of that type. And I'd like to see that kind of get modernized and, um, uh, put out to the to the big screen or in theater where it's more accessible to people, and so it's kind of a weird thing to say that I'd like a self help mm-hmm. book and get an adaptation, but I just think it would be a nice like I don't know what I'm talking about, but that, that yeah, you guys you get what I'm saying. Yeah. So I'm trying to uh, think. Uh, um, still thinking about it. Yeah, it's tough. I also read uh, Battle of the Books uh, in middle school, and Mm -hmm. I thought I was the coolest thing because I would skim all the books, wouldn't retain most of the information, but I remembered the titles and authors, and that was kind of like my use for the team. And Mm -hmm. this one book that I skimmed really stood out, and it's The Red Pyramid by Rick Reardon talking about Egyptian mythology, which is very, it's a very Mm -hmm. children's book, but I'd like to see it. It's still good. I it's it. great. It's fantastic. So yeah. I think like um, when you first asked this question, all I could think it was like the adaptations that I'd like to see redone 
that are either now sort of a bit old or um, could be done better or somebody just royally messed up. Um, yeah. And Percy, the Percy Jackson series is one of those for me. Um, Thank you. It's an I, atrocity. Yes. Uh, but <laughs> there's some like, I'm a huge fan of British television. Um, I'm trying to, there was one I was just talking about not so long ago that I'd love to see sort of remade. Um, but like, I love detective fiction and stuff like that. And so some of like the series is, or the series that I'm coming to um, are beginning to sort of be serialized um, in some respect or uh, dramatized, um, even put on stage in a way. Uh, and so I can't think of one that I'd like to see like sort of changed in a way. Um, and I'm trying to think now of texts that like I teach that I'd like to see updated. Um, but the one format that I, I really love is I've taught, um, actually I can talk about this. The, <laughs> so I can talk about formats I like to see used in You're adaptation. Just trouble now. Um, the, I love Persepolis by Marjane Satrapi the, and the way that the film, um, really does justice to the story, uh, and is, and is done in the same style. Like, so it's a black and white graphic all the way through, except for certain moments. Um, and I recently just watched, it's a couple of years old now, uh, Loving Vincent. It's a sort of a, a film about Vincent Van Gogh that's, to, that's totally hand-drawn or hand-painted. Um, mm -hmm. And so the styles of that are really interesting for like all the possibilities of film um, that you could do and things that you could, would almost be impossible to do on stage, especially for anything lower than like the National Theater um, or Broadway. Uh, those I would like to see done a little bit more um just that style i'd like to see explored so oh, especially yeah. since it's becoming so popular as, as someone who teaches high school students yeah. i think that that's a market we can play with absolutely also i hate to say it i really hate to say it but the uh percy jackson lightning thief movie is like a i know it's bad i know it's atrocious but it's a guilty pleasure <laughs> oh, oh. Say, i i reread the books um, and I love, I love audiobooks. I listen to them all the time. Um, and so audio dramas too are, are really fun. Oh yeah, absolutely. Jeremy, what, what would you like to see adapted or who do you think messed up in an adaptation? Um, I don't know if I have an answer to the who messed up. I mean, I have pretty strong feelings about things I see, but <laughs> I never would have guessed. I don't. <laughs> Nothing, nothing comes to mind. I mean, the worst thing I've seen recently is Avatar 2. Um, oh, and really? okay. and uh, it's an adaptation in a way. It's not trying to be, but it's basically every movie you've ever seen. Um, just uh, like all those tropes, like applied in a different way in a different world. Um, that's not an adaptation, though. Um, the first thing that came to mind were probably some Neil Gaiman titles. Um, mm -hmm. Neverwhere. Um, oh yes. I was in Chief of Mono. Um like I would have said several years ago, Ocean at the end of the line, which I think is my favorite book of his, and now it's been adapted for the stage. Um, and I think it's coming to the US before too long. I know it's touring in the UK. Um uh and so I'm interested in, in that in terms of contemporary writers. Um the great thing about doing theater is that, you know, everything, you know, everything's an adaptation. Even if we're putting on Much Ado About Nothing for the 14th time, we are <laughs> thinking about how to adapt it and kind of what lens we want to put on it. So yeah. uh, I I run out of and, and that. And like Shakespeare is the only thing I read consistently. And by read, I mean sitting in a rehearsal room trying to work on this play, you know, um, and so, yeah, well, that doesn't answer your question. But no, um, I would say never wear new again. I'll second it. Yeah. So I I'm going to take, oh, sorry. What were you supposed to say? No, I just said, like, I, for, I forgot about that because I have been wishing for one for a while. I'm amazed we don't have one yet. Hmm. But um, I want to I wanna touch back on the uh, Avatar 2 thing. It, it fits because way of water, water, it's a thing. But first, 
I'm going to tell you about some of, the, uh, some of the beautiful, wonderful people that made this show possible here today. The Sweet Tea Shakespeare podcast is the official podcast for all things Sweet Tea Shakespeare and is made possible by a number of wonderful people and organizations. We are supported by a grant from the Arts Council of Fayetteville, the NC Arts Council, and by contributions from the City of Fayetteville, Cumberland County, and other supporting partners. We would like to take a moment to thank our Patreon supporters of all levels. This is made possible from your generous contributions, and we thank you. Do you want to join our lovely list of supporters? You can find us on patreon.com slash Sweet Tea Shakes. We're starting off 2023 strong with two shows at Sweet Tea Shakespeare, one in Fayetteville and one in Raleigh. In Fayetteville, we have 20,000 links under the sea from January 20th over to February 5th, only at the Fable Pie Company. Join us on this unique, immersive, one-of-a-kind experience under the sea at the Fable Pie Company, where each ticket also includes a pie. Over on our Raleigh side, we have Henry IV Part Two running from January 26th to January 29th. This is a one week and only experience that you don't want to miss. That only has four actors doing the entire show. So trust me, this is not one you're going to want to miss. We thank you for all that you do to make this show possible. Now, let's get back to the action. Okay, and we're back. I know that I'm getting all that out of the way, but I'm, I want to tell you guys a little story. So, um, I, weird is a normal, but... Thursday, Wednesday, I don't know. I don't care. And we, uh, the, the in-laws decided to bring us to the movie. We're having a good little, they would get a little time on the town. And uh, I, I take a little seat. I get my little laser 3D glasses on. We're about to get fully immersed. I'm about front row to see Avatar 2 in 3D, in laser 3D. <laughs> and I get a text by someone, by some jabroni. And, and I see it's Jeremy. I'm like, oh whoa what's up and then he said what do you say you say something like i see you <laughs> this is true <laughs> so i see you and i'm like um i, I think I, like it's one of those things where you kind of know what's going to happen next but you like don't really want to see it through and you're like I, I just say something like what are you talking about he says i'm in row h or something like that i turn around <laughs> and there he is Chilling in the back with his little glasses on. He's got his feet a little kicked up and something. And he says, <laughs> and yeah, we did plan this. We did, I, you know, it's the little things in life that you, that you this absolutely look forward to. <laughs> and um, I'm kind of baffled because uh, on the way home, after I see a movie that I, that I have a good time with, I, I want to talk about it. I love movies and I'm like, I'm super jazzed about it. And who else am I going to talk to besides the guy, who, this, the, this guy who just saw it with me? So <laughs> I text him the big old message like, oh, this, I, it was a spectacle and this and that. And it was world building and stuff like that. And um, I think he, he was like on the road or he had his notifications off or something. And then I checked Facebook right after and he's like, that was the worst thing I've seen in years. <laughs> I'm like, well, I can't. Can't undo the text. I, it's sent. He knows how I feel, and that's just how it's going to be. And that, that was all that was said about it. But I never got to see. Like, I need you to just go off on Avatar 2. I need to know. Okay. So um, I, I didn't expect to be this fired up this this early on a Sunday. <laughs> um, and I have to conserve some of my energy because we have uh, tech rehearsal here in a little while. But what I will say is, you know, so like from a as a technological achievement, just like the first one, it's mind blowing. I mean, it's like there are things happening in that movie that have never happened before in in any movie ever, uh, and it ha it has like dozens or hundreds of those instances um, throughout. Like ha like impossible tech. It is the future of a lot of movie making, um, and just the the technical achievement is is uh, really really impressive. Um, and James Cameron, in my view, as an emblem for, I know there were several writers on this one, uh, is, is, is not a great writer of stories. So the reason I invested in that particular one, and I did invest, is because of the, the visuals. Um, and, the, you know, I insisted that we go and see the 3D because I think it's just magical what they're able to pull off. But as a story and character writer, there's not a lot for me going on. Um, and one of my tests for that is, have I, 
have I seen this before? Do I get ahead of you? And like, that's why I think I said on Facebook, it's like, this one was like, la uh, last of the Mohicans in, in space underwater. And the last one was dances with wolves in space in trees. And like, the, just the borrowing of tropes and the, like, there's nothing new going on. And um, I would also argue with both of these that, that, you know, he started the avatar sort of world building before uh, a lot of the world, including older white men, uh, have been confronted as, as they have in recent years by the issues of cultural appropriation, which is all over that franchise and makes me sort of cringe at the sort of like, uh, the, just the pathway that takes. Setting the politics aside though, I don't, I mean, what he's writing is clear. It's just been done before. It feels very borrowed. And so one of my tests is like, what is my brain doing when I'm watching this thing? Is it invested in the, in what's going on in the story? Or is it making a grocery list? And like, I made a grocery list. I just made a grocery list. It was just like, what else do I have going on in my life? Um, and sometimes I was able to be sort of arrested back in, you know, there's something compelling visually going on or something like that. Um, but I always find that if you don't, like the visuals are always an insurance for the story itself and the characters and what they've got going on. And so if you're relying on that as your, as your sort of chief motivator for somebody to watch something like it's not going to work very, it's not, it's just not going to work very well. And that's yeah. why I felt like, well, that's why I felt this is kind of a weak franchise. It's probably not actually the worst thing I've seen in years, but it, uh, with regard to the hype, it, yeah. there was the widest gap is the way I would put it. There's also a lot of uh, recency bias too, where it's like, you feel so passionate because this is the thing being talked about right now. Even Avatar One was talked about right before Two was was dropped. So there's a lot of lot of stuff, a lot of it happening right now. And uh, but we'll probably die down until the the next one comes out in two years. Jessica, did you see Avatar Two yet already? I have not. I am a terrible moviegoer. Oh no, we can't hang ever. Oh it's over. Yeah, I'm sorry. You're in the world of books. I'm in the world of movies. We are we are not the same. <laughs> My life is with the teenagers. Oh no, that's tragic. I'm so sorry. I, for your I can quote passages from the books that I reread for teaching, but oh, that's, that's not as interesting. No, that's a flex. <laughs> that's a, that's a flex. You you got to flash that degree. You got to flash that 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 skill. You can whenever you can. Sure. Um, do you want to see it? Like, how? Where do you stand on the franchise itself? I do. I am as, as a terrible movie goer. I think I saw the first Avatar maybe a year ago. Um, I watched it like during the summer. I was like, oh, I've never seen this. Like, OK, I'll give it a shot. Um, and actually, it's probably like a year and a half ago um, and saw it. But it was amazing and beautiful. Uh, and there were some really lovely moments in it. Um, one of my, I watched it with one of my best friends who like cries at happy things. Um, and so was just like crying throughout it was funny uh because i am not that person but uh i loved it I, I was sort of excited to see the the second one and now i'm i'm like i'll just I'll, I'll wait for it to hit streaming or whatever i'm not curious enough to go and sort of sit and watch it and invest or be compelled to watch it i guess mm. so but no, yeah, that's, i will that's see fine. it and have like the the context I think the fr this franchise is really interesting to me, maybe not because of the actual thing itself, but just because of how polarizing it is. There are people that are like absolutely for it or people that hate it. There's, there's no in between. And I feel like a lot of franchises are getting that lately. Um, I, I guess because of how accessible it is to everyone. So it's just so easily to take one side. Um, I personally have been on both with uh, the first one, I've seen it on Redbox after it left the theaters. You know, I was really late. And I saw it on a really crappy TV and it was really nothing to be desired. It was like Jeremy was saying, it was very borrowed. The script was weak and it just was like, what, what was the point, right? And um, um, me and Jeremy were talking about it earlier too, not today or anything, but 
uh, we were saying how uh, the first one, if you were to watch it in the 3D, if you were there, you were locked in. And it was kind mm-hmm. of that testament. It was really compelling like reality. to see visually. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I didn't get it at the time. And I totally get it now. Um, even with, you know, being oversaturized with the Marvel stuff and everything being CG, I was afraid, okay, well, we're, how are they, how is James Cameron going to do it? And, um, you know, I was locked in. I liked it. I don't, I don't, there, I have a lot of criticisms with it, but I overall had a, a great time. Um, more, it was more so because it was surprising. Um, so I don't know how the rest of them are going to go. I'm not expecting it to be like the writing was left to be desired. Um, and it doesn't help that James Cameron's on Twitter <laughs> talking about how, how much of a god he is at filmmaking. Like, don't, you lose point. I, you lose points for me on that. But um, I totally understand like both sides of that. I just thought that was super interesting, and the way that that story is just mentally scarring. The fact that I uh, have a little secret admirer behind me in the <laughs> for three hours. <laughs> Who would have thought, right? <laughs> Um, I had a super interesting, what were you about to say? I was going to say, it's, it's interesting too, like how, um, being the nerd that I am, we're sort of talking about like people being associated with their stories, like even more so than they used to be. Like the, the earliest novels sometimes were published anonymously because people like it was the, um, it was the newest form of literature. People didn't want to claim it or claim a new, um, piece of fiction that was literally a lie. Um, yeah. because it could ruin their established reputation as an essayist or a poet. Um, and so, and then as it became more legitimate, sort of people were like, it was, pu- things were published by the author of their previous success. And so they became known like by their works uh, and they had sort of a public persona. And even now, like people are becoming, people in their stories are becoming uh, more and more associated with the personal behavior of their author or creator, people associated with them. So it's it's just interesting to me how trends like that work sometimes. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Sorry, go ahead sure. with what you're saying. Oh, you're fine, you're fine. Um, I was at a loss for words at the, at the moment. So it's it's good that you did that. You did that. Um, I want to, it's kind of weird that I'm, that this kind of question is being said at near the end of the episode, but like, tell me a little bit, I'll start with Jessica. Um, tell me a little bit about like, going back to sweet tea shakespeare like what you're giving me a little bit of history how you founded it and where you stand today and what you're hoping to do in the future and all that fun stuff that's a good question um it actually started uh one of my best friends um ruth nelson who now has since has moved away um did uh some productions she was she had an mfa so she was a huge theater person. Um, and so just in turn and being her friend, I went to see her in things and, um, went to see her in a production, Sweet Tea's Romeo and Juliet, I think back in 2013. Um, and then I was talking to somebody else who the, actually the director of 12th night. Um, it's like the first winter show that Sweet Tea did maybe like 2013, 2014, somewhere in there. Um, and it's like, well, you should come audition. And I hadn't really been in a play since college. And so I went and auditioned and got cast. And that was my first Sweet Tea show. It came up in my memories. Um, yeah, it was being like eight years ago or something like that. So I think it was January 2014. 12th night went up. Um, and so like for the next five years or so, um, I got more and more involved. And uh, throughout like <laughs> various processes, I started writing, directing, doing different things. Um, and it just became a huge part of my life uh, and met so many delightful people, got to do so many fascinating things um, that I never would have been able to do otherwise. So mm. I think it influenced a huge, it gave me a chance to exercise different kinds of creativity, which was really lovely um, and shaped a lot of my perspectives as, as a teacher, as a thinker. Um, it really like gave me a chance to explore things. So um in 2019, I took a step back from being all of, from really everything, uh, because I felt like in many ways I was, I'm, I'm someone who likes to do things well. And I felt like I was doing too many things and not doing any of them well, um, and hadn't been for a while. Uh, and that got to me. So <laughs> in terms of just being better overall, 
uh, I stepped away from the company and hadn't really done anything until last, about a year ago. Um, uh, Jeremy invited me to do Behold. And so came back into that. And this is the first sort of main stage show that I've been involved with since Made Marion in 2019. So it's been fun to get back into it, but it's also been hard <laughs> to sort of find time to manage everything. Um, cause I've forgotten how much of a mental investment some things take, uh, and just the, the business of life or I started a, new, a different job this year. And so the business that has been a challenge to find out how to juggle that. Um, but it's been, it's been a really fun challenge, um, to, to spend time with this script and think about, uh, theater in this way again. So I'm grateful for the, the chance to be involved. Do you find yourself, um, adapting scripts in the, in the future, or is this kind of, do you need to like take a break after this with this being so much work? Um, it, it's something I think about, like I, I live with stories all day long um, and teaching them. And so it's actually a question like we, that we, we talk about regularly. They learn like I make references, to, I love cooking and baking. So I tend to speak in metaphors um, and the language that I go to is either that of theater or that of the kitchen. Uh, so we talk about like different flavors of things or like if we were analyzing this, this text sort of as if we were looking at this in terms of theatrical perspective or an actor's perspective, this is how it, what kind of bearing it might have on our analysis. Yeah. And so I think it's, it's just, it's always going to be a part of my brain. Um, and the, I'll, I'm hoping to go back and look at some past scripts that I've done um, prior to this and revise them or tweak them because everyone has been written in sort of a crucible of a deadline or a, a production. And I'd like to go back and sort of tweak things and revisit them, see how the stories are changed or how I would look at them differently now. So mm. I think I'll, I'll revisit some and possibly do more in the future. So we'll see. Nice. That's exciting. Yeah. So this is the moment we've been waiting for. Jeremy, tell me how it happened. Tell us how it happened. So, so uh, well, you want the history of Sweet Tea Shakespeare? Let's do it. We're in, in the, the week. Three minutes. <laughs> this is going to be a challenge. I know. <laughs> do you need a timer on screen? Oh, it might, it might not hurt. Um, I mean, I can give you time. So, <laughs> the, uh, um, we started as a summer side project. Um, I started it in the summer of 2012. Um, you know, we got a few thousand dollars, I think at that point from the arts council to, to do a couple shows. Um, and, uh, they did fine. I mean, like I had sort of had the idea of building a company for a while, even before I lived in Fayetteville. Um, and we did that a couple of years and then I, I, I realized that it was really hard work to try and rebuild a company every summer. Um, it's actually some part of it that's a little easier just to keep the momentum going. And so we sort of evolved uh, into a year round thing. Um, and uh, that sort of just like guided our work for a while. It was just like, hey, we want to do shows. And so we're just going to keep doing them. Um, and over the course of the last 10 years, um, we've just had a lot of like different like milestones of like we need to evolve in some way. And one of those is kind of moving from like going project to project to kind of having uh, like an actual company that does stuff. Um, and so we went through that evolution and um, we went through the evolution of like creating the organizational part of that. And we went through the evolution of like figuring out what to do during COVID um, and then figuring out what to do coming out of COVID. That was all of, of last year, really. Um, and now we're doing what I think everyone else is doing on the planet, which is figuring out what you want your post COVID life to look like after having kind of been locked inside and figured out like what a rebalancing is like and, and all of that. So we're in a, uh, just looking ahead, what I think we're looking at is like, what does the next 
sort of evolution of sweet tea look like, keeping all of that in mind. And, and we don't know is a short answer, but we're going to meet a lot and, and shape a lot and sort of figure out what, what right looks like to us going forward. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh my goodness. It's been an absolutely wonderful episode with both of you guys. I'm very glad that we were able to talk about 20,000 leagues. I mean, this is, this is the first time that we've had a, um, a playwright in a way on the, on the show. So this is a, this is an honor. We're making history every, every episode. Um, thank you guys both for joining me. Um, I have a little surprise for our audience, a little, little, little uh, teaser um, for 20,000 leagues. I know we have that first trailer, but we got a little bumper that I'm about to play right now. Wow, that just that just blew my mind. <laughs> I've you never do good work. You do good work. <laughs> Full disclosure. All right, I'm gonna let you guys in on a little editing secret. I did not actually watch the trailer with the audience. None of us watched the trailer with the audience. So having that little pause and doing that, it, it threw me off. It was it was very weird. It's gonna make a lot more sense in post, but right now it's just it feels weird. But thank you again, guys, for joining me. Um we have some wonderful people that made this happen, and we cannot wait to talk with some of the cast for 20,000 Leagues. We also have our Henry IV cast and crew. Uh, it's very, very soon episode. We're super excited about it. And, yeah, thank you for joining me, uh, you two, and the, everybody watching and listening. Um, and, yeah, there was something else I was going to say, but I totally forgot it. So thank you guys for watching. See you soon. Thank you.